All right, I'm now at the section, the fourth section of this uh, second Miller lecture, which is called The Western Way of War. And author Victor Davis Hanson has argued in his book, The Western Way of War, <clears throat> that close combat is really what makes war work, and that humanity um, at war is the real thing. So, okay, here's here's how this argument goes. I'm going to just bear, bear with me. It's It's... Okay, he's got a lot. This guy's got a lot of followers. He's a very dangerous guy. The argument is, if we fight human to human um, or hand to hand, then killing takes uh, a physical and emotional. It takes the strongest of us to do that. You don't let people have guns. People have to fight with edged weapons um, or the equivalent, you know, as other axes or hammers or you know something like that. Only those who can look an enemy in the eye and kill them deserve to be citizens or voters in uh, Hansen's world. So what he's arguing for is a return to uh, physical one-on-one <clears throat> -on -one fighting, um, and this ain't no cosplay, where people actually get killed. <clears throat> and they get killed because they are killed with an edge weapon. Um, so there's a lot of clanging and banging, and <clears throat> you don't use long-range weapons. Bows, no crossbows nothing that can throw a um, <clears throat> nothing that can throw a bolt uh, if you can throw a spear that's okay you know, so sword fighting uh, at, as I say fighting with axes hand weapons all okay and he believes that this will make war great again and uh, <laughs> make war great again and um, that that will return what war is meant to be that war is fundamentally I know how stupid this sounds, a social enterprise, which is true. I mean, it is social. It's just not a very nice kind of social. Um, okay. The hoplites who fought at Thermopylae, um, so remember the hoplite is, a, is called a hoplite because of the hoplon, which is the round shield, um, is designed to be used in formation so that um, they are not only masters of the edge weapon and the spear, but also they're, they're masters of linking their shields together and making an impenetrable line. Um, and it was hard to beat that line. Um, that's the, that is the strength of the phalanx because it's an early technology where you say, okay, look, we can't, we don't actually, we can't make better weapons. Uh, we can't, you can't, the human being can only carry so much over the course of the day. You're going to get tired fast. You're fighting in the heat um, and so on and so on. So, uh, what are we going to do? Well, we'll put humans together in masses, and we'll we'll organize the masses. Okay, so the Spartan way of war is a communal one, and it it the the strength of the phalanx rests on the strength of all of its members. So you put your your strongest member at the pinnacle, the the peak, essentially the front line of the the front of the front line of the phalanx, so that that person doesn't get broken and if that doesn't that point doesn't get broken the rest of the line will hold and you put your weakest people at the end of the line okay it just makes sense so if they get picked off it's like okay well it's too bad but you know we didn't lose the whole line so there's a there's a lot of intelligence essentially in the organization of this kind of war um fighting with edged weapons uh for hansen and miller uses hansen and if you look at the very back part of the book you'll see oh yeah this is what miller says you know he's got this you know and and you should read you know <laughs> and and there his little reading list is victor davis hansen the western way of war amongst others and this is where miller has drawn his military stuff basically um and it's a terrible shame says hansen that this way of war has passed and um, he thinks that what we should do instead is essentially have nations set up um, a, a sort of big arenas, like it needs to be big arenas, right? I mean, like, you know, you'd set aside massive parklands and have war games uh, between uh, these different sides and let them kill each other. And whoever outkills the other side, the trains the best, they win the war. And this has been, this kind of idea has been proposed for centuries um, and it just, it just doesn't work. You, you can see why. <laughs> so, um, the uh, but the idea is based in, you know, you to be strong, you have to be able to kill somebody else directly. You have to look them in the eye and kill them. That's the idea. And this is what Game of Thrones is all about, right? That you're not a real person until you actually can kill somebody. You know, okay, yeah. So 
that's the real problem. And people are like, yeah, but it's good for women. It's like, really? How's that? I mean, okay, great. It, it reads women into the same corrupt system that men are in. How is that good? It's like, oh, okay. I mean, I guess it's a, it's a plus, I guess. You know, yeah. Not. <laughs> so, um, I mean, okay. <laughs> I, won't, I won't lose it. Um, so, for instance, uh, let me let me put up a, an image here of um, what has happened, however, to the battlefield, and this is the kind of thing which Hansen is is on about. And so, so this is this is an image I use you know, in an article I wrote about something I can't remember what military science about something. Anyway, um, here's the this is this image is based on. Um, uh, information that comes from Martin Van Creveld, who is an Israeli military historian. He's very famous. Um, who wrote a book, one of his books is called War and Technology. But he's written, he writes, he wrote a book about every, just about every year. I mean, he's a very prolific guy. And much uh, admired by the Israeli defense establishment. Um, he's a bright guy. And he talks about emptying the battlefield. So have a look at this image here. All right, we're going to have a bit of an intervention here about this discussion about the uh, person on the battlefield. Uh, I've had to dig around. Uh, okay, so I created this image, just to be clear. Um, it's taken from Martin Van Creveld's information. What you're looking at then is that the red dot is a person. And um, the uh, idea in the... Um, if you're holding a short sword, is that you can probably clear out um, a range, an arm's length, basically, around you. Uh, so that's sort of the red square. It's rough, and a rough estimate. Then the um, green square is the 18th century when we have early muskets. Now, a musket, these are, you've seen these in, you know, historical films or some a bunch of poor bastards are standing there and they're pouring, they're actually pouring um, black powder down the, down inside the weapon muzzle and then they put in a piece of gun wadding, cotton usually, and then they ram it down and then they throw a ball in on top of it and then they set a slow match to the, okay, there's, that's one possibility. Or it, you might see something like um, a person actually put an early cartridge which is the concept of actually putting all that stuff in one so you you get a little piece of paper it's kind of like rolling a joint i guess and <laughs> this is the joint of war <laughs> oh god this is a be a heavy draw and um the propellant is at one end and the, fundamentally every shell is still the same explosive propellant it's usually called propellant at one end uh then some kind of of um material that will prevent the uh, shot from being deformed by the explosion of the propellant going off then the shot itself it's these are called kinetic weapons because they they only fly basically that is they they have the reason that a kinetic weapon will kill you is that it's traveling at sufficient speed to have a piece of metal fly into your body so it's called kinetic because it's it's moving it doesn't explode, thank God. Um, they Some of them do. Okay, so this is the 18th century. By the Civil War, the middle of the 18th century, middle to late part of the 18th century, they're beginning to uh, put these things into twists, and this is an early shell, essentially. There's a twist of paper. Um, it, but still they're using, a lot of them are still using smoothbore muskets. But what really is going to make a difference, especially by the end of the war, is what is called the rifled musket. Um, I always been careful of that because years and years ago, when I first the first lecture I ever gave, <laughs> this is so funny. Oh, we got notes in our in the exam, people writing about the rifled muskrat, and we were like, rifled muskrat? <laughs> what the hell is that? Oh yeah, so people didn't know, <laughs> you know, what I was talking about. So they were, what the hell is a musket? So basically, a rifle is called that because it's a smooth bore, but it has this little, very fine line inside it, which is a spiral. 
right? It, it looks like a spring if you if you pull the, a spring out. So it's one. It's all one piece, and it imparts spin to the bullet as it leaves the the uh, the tube. So you've got the longer the tube, to a, a certain extent, the better it go. It better it is. Uh, the better your aim is going to be. And so the bullet starts its journey down the tube. And as it does, it uh, this has this very, very fine line of rifling. And if you can see, if you look inside a gun barrel, uh, don't look in the business end, <laughs> look on the other end, <laughs> look from the chamber side. Um, you'll If you look into the light, you'll see this very, very fine line. That's the rifling. And a, rifle, a rifling is basically a spiral. So it's kind of like calling a, right, a gun a spiral because that's kind of what it is. You know, it's, it's one big long spiral. So why a rifle is so much better than a musket is that a musket has a smooth bore. So the bullet comes flying out and it goes, bloop, it doesn't last, it doesn't go very far. It's not very uh, um, accurate. I mean, it's, you know, they're, you might be hit by one of these, you might not be. Um, you're probably certainly not going to be hit where you expect you expect to be. The powder won't go off. I mean, you know, the, the weapons are very unreliable. But by the middle of the 18th century, that is by 1860, by 1861, at the point the war starts, by 1865 when it's finished, they've had five years to perfect these weapons, and they are accurate long rifles. And so you'll see uh, pictures, uh, etchings, because there were early photographs, the first war photographs we have, are from the Civil War. Matthew Brady's uh, pictures of American dead um, in the Civil War, and they are considered to be classics because of that. They're also amazing photographs. Have a look, Matthew Brady. Uh, I'm trying to remember the spelling of his name. It's an unusual spelling, but anyway, I think it's Matthew with one T, not two. Um, and uh, so these this rifling makes for accurate gunfire. And so you can now hit up to 25 yards away. And that is a considerable distance. It's a quarter of a football field, which means that the troops have to stand off from each other at least that much, probably more, because they can. if you just move up a little bit, then you're within range. So you need to clear the distance. So the battlefield starts to empty out and get emptier and emptier because the troops have to be further and further away from each other, right? Because the guns are getting better and better. There are at this time also early Gatling guns, um, so you can have so as if somebody engages in a charge, and they did st did still engage in these stupid frontal charges that they were doing, where a whole bunch of men would just run across a field, screaming and, and firing their weapons. Anyway, what a mess. Okay, so that's uh, a one to twenty-five ratio. By the time we get to World War One, you can see that the ratio has become one to two hundred and fifty. So this is only really another 35 years later, 40 years later, basically, where rifles have become extremely accurate. Um, some of them can repeat fire. You're now using enclosed shells where the bullet seems to be this big, long thing, right? And you'll see the, a bullet, a cartridge. It's re what you're really looking at is a cartridge, and it'll be all brass. The same part of it is still is is still true. The three parts of the of the bullet are still necessary, or of the sh shell. Let me call it that, um, because that's really what it is. The bottom part is the propellant, um, and it has a little little circle at the end where the the um, firing pin will hit it and set off the propellant. Right? Um, it will blow outwards. Then there is some kind of wadding um, between the propellant and the bullet itself because you don't want the bullet to be deformed because it's got to make this trip down the down the tube if it makes the trip down the tube only halfway and blows up uh and that is shatters the tube you've got a bunch of uh, hot metal splinters in your face you don't want that right um so and it happened um, and then the tip is the actual part you're trying to get into somebody else's body so the actual bullet itself is a little pointed piece of lead often now, at the very end of the Civil War, they began using these Minet balls, which they weren't really balls. They looked like little beehives, and they were awful. I mean, they, they opened up, right? When they, they hit any, they were very soft. And so when they hit flesh, um, and especially when they hit bone, they tended to blossom. And this is why there were so many deaths, uh, partly one of the reasons why. Okay. Um, so that's World War One. 
right, where we're getting to 1 to 250, where you really are clearing out. So now this is why we have a trench war, because you can't get up. The weapons are just too damn dangerous. You have to be behind a bunch of mud, basically, the whole time. You've got to be behind sandbags. They still are doing these frontal charges, which is absolute stupidity. Um, and by now, they're up against effective long-range Gatling and other kinds of... Um, any number, there are three or four major manufacturers of um, uh, effective high powered uh, machine guns. So, submachine guns are, are guns that rapidly fire a number of shots that you can carry. So, a machine gun that needs to be in place is a standard machine gun. A submachine gun is a gun which uh, say has a banana clip like the AK-47 that's a submachine gun an A1 uh, pardon me an M16 A1 or a, an M16 A1 or A2 is a submachine gun an Uzi is a submachine gun you typically see these things a Thompson is a submachine gun uh, they sort of at a certain point they stopped using the word sub it's just like it's a machine gun it's like, but really it's an automatic weapon that's really where we're at now uh, okay by World War II Battlefield is now at 1 to 750, which means that you can really clear out the battlefield if you are one person, you have a rifle. And these these were heavy rifles. They fired about five, usually, uh, shells in a clip. And um, you can see them, the, the, you see that, you can occasionally see this in a movie, which is accurate. Like, you do see this in Private Ryan at the end. You'll see there's a, real, a really clear shot where... Um, somebody's firing as blam, 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 five shots, and then ding, and you'll see a spring pop out of the top of the gun. That's essentially the, the cartridge holder, this, uh, an early magazine. Um, and magazines become the standard because you preload a magazine and then you replace the magazine. So the whole thing is going towards distance, accuracy, and volume. Right, that's where we're going. So we're going from these very low-end weapons where you can barely get a shot out and it's not dangerous to these very easy, easily reloaded, accurate weapons which you don't really need a lot of training to use. I mean, to, to get good with a, a rifled musket in the Civil War, I mean, people spent their lives shooting to become these snipers that you'll see. As I say, you can see etchings of them you know, sitting up in trees and they've got these long guns. Um, by World War I, you know, you, you could get good, and people were designated marks, marks, marksmen. By World War II, um, people had real skill with these weapons, and they were deadly, and this brings on the sniper battles. The last square is really the blank whiteness, which um, I filled in uh, in another version of this where it's the contemporary war zone so anything after anything after vietnam basically where you're dealing with um because the the m16 was uh taken basically once the war was over and remade into this uh i mean what the american army was looking for or what the american military was looking for was a replacement that would be as good if not better than the ak-47 which is as i think i've said before bar none the essentially best overall weapon that there is on the face of the earth at the moment. It is also the most popular um, automatic weapon that there is. It's extraordinarily dangerous. And these things can be left in water for three days. They can be dropped. They can be, I mean, they can get mud in them. They still work. They just work and work and work. It's just an absolute nightmare. Um, and they were designed that way, which is why uh, Kalashnikov, who was the Soviet arms designer who designed this arm uh, was made a uh, hero of the of the um, hero of the state because basically he <laughs> that's it you know he had one job and he did it beautifully um, anyway so yeah so there's this other wider uh, square essentially it's the white square that underlines this thing which is one to two thousand which is where we are now where if you have if you have the kind of training that you see Chris Kyle have, and if you're a natural shooter, there actually has to also be talent because there are so many factors that read into this that make uh, for a sniper um, understanding and reading essentially the wind, the air, the air pressure, all the things that are going to, because the, the, the bullet 
the actual projectile has to travel 2,000 yards, right? Which is a half a, well, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> 2,000 yards. Um, so it's got to travel a long, long way. In that, in that time, it's going to arc. And so you have to know where it's going to come down, how it's going to come down, all that stuff. So a person can be effective at 2,000 yards. It's just unusual. I mean, but it's the outside range at the moment. Now, these are with weapons that are dumb kinetic weapons. But what we're now seeing that's coming out of the stuff that's coming out of, well, this is really old now. I mean, it's been 10, 15 years. The last time I looked at uh, smart munitions, and these are munitions which can be told what to do, you know, how to fire, when to blow up, um, and so on. And they have sensors in them, and they can be programmed. You can program them in the in the in the weapon. And you can say, okay, I want you know, let me have three bursting flares and then three bursting three air bursts and then let me have you know, okay, so um, one to two thousand is where we're at now. Okay, that should do it.